What is going on guys? Nick here back with another video. A few people have asked me to take a look at DraftKings and as somebody who's been playing daily fantasy through them for the past couple of NFL seasons, I thought this would be an interesting one to take a look at. So in this video, I'll go through the business. I'll take a look at how well they're performing financially, what I think the stock is worth, and if this is something worth buying now. So DraftKings became a publicly traded company in April of 2020 through a SPAC, or Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Usually when a company is listed on the stock market, they'll go through an initial public offering, or IPO. This is a much longer process involving more regulatory scrutiny than a SPAC. SPACs are companies that are created to raise funds through an IPO, and then they have to use those funds to acquire a business. In DraftKings case, DraftKings combined with a SPAC called Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp and SB Tech, a betting and gaming technology company. DraftKings started in 2012 as a side hustle between Jason Robbins, Matthew Kalish, and Paul Lieberman. Kalish, a huge fantasy sports player who would enter into 200 leagues per year, said the idea was to create a website where fantasy sports fans could make daily bets on players every single day, instead of waiting the entire season to collect their winnings. There were a lot of questions when they started gaining public attention during heavy advertising campaigns. People were wondering if it was actually legal. Well, under the 2006 federal law, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act, there was an exception made for games of skill. The law says it's legal if all winning outcomes reflect the relative knowledge and skill of the participants and are determined predominantly by the accumulated statistical results of the performance of the individuals, athletes in the case of sporting events, in multiple real world sporting events or other events and that no winning outcome is based on the score, point spread, and performance of any single real-world team or combination of such teams, or solely on any single performance of an individual athlete in any single real-world sporting event or other event. Now this only applies to federal law. States are actually free to make their own laws limiting daily fantasy sports. But the biggest game changer for DraftKings came in 2018, after the Supreme Court struck down a 1992 federal law that prohibited most states from authorizing sports betting. The Supreme Court said it was up to states to decide if they wanted sports betting or not, and the federal law was in violation of the Constitution by forcing states to prohibit sports betting under their own state laws. As a whole, the sports gaming industry is a massive market with an estimated $456 billion in global revenue generated in 2019. Online gaming has recently taken off within the sector, growing 10% per year from 2014 to 2018, versus 2% growth for the entire gaming industry. Online gaming is projected to double the market share of total gaming from 8 to 15% by 2024. DraftKings is currently focused on the US market growth, so most of this information will be geared towards that focus. DraftKings believes as more states legalize sports betting that customers have a strong preference for betting online versus retail sports books or at an event or casino. Interestingly, in North America, only 5% of the estimated $134 billion in gaming revenue was generated from online gaming. DraftKings says that they see this area as a huge opportunity because in the UK, for example, about 45% of their gaming revenue is from online gaming. The big holdup is having to wait for each state to legalize online sports betting, and then DraftKings has to aggressively market to gain market share. And a few areas actually have some pretty odd quirks to their laws. For example, Oregon only allows bettors to wager online through one app called Scoreboard, which is a partnership with the Oregon Lottery and SB Tech. DC also only allows sports betting through a government owned app. This aggressive marketing has been pretty expensive though. A report on FanDuel found that they spent $68 per customer acquisition, but each customer on average made them about $100. I think that this aggressive advertising will continue for some time, as long as they continue to gain high value customers. But I also think that eventually this customer acquisition cost will increase as it's no longer the new thing and the remaining pool of customers will become people who are less and less inclined to have interest in sports betting. I would also guess that those who are less interested in sports betting to be people who will also spend less. I think though that this is still a long way away with all of the states that still haven't legalized sports betting yet. Now let's take a look at the reported revenue, operating income, and net income. We can see pretty good revenue growth, but they've taken massive losses over the last year. We only have limited information though, only going back to 2017. Looking at expenses, what jumps out is the cost over the past year in pretty much all of their categories. They explain that the increase in the cost of revenue is due to the combination of DraftKings and SB Tech and how the value of their assets are calculated. They also had to pay higher tax rates on their sportsbook and iGaming revenues. Sales and marketing costs grew because of higher ad spending to increase the awareness of the DraftKings sportsbooks in the six states that recently started to allow online sports betting. 
The general and administrative $127 million cost increase was mostly due to $80 million in stock-based compensation and the acquisition of SB Tech. If these expenses had not been included, they would have only increased their general and administrative costs by $17 million. One of the most important metrics for measuring DraftKings growth is their average monthly unique customers. Interestingly, they grew their customer base by about 20% in the first three quarters of 2020 compared to the first three quarters of 2019. The amount of revenue generated by each customer also slightly increased from $38 to $41. This is actually the opposite of what I expected, that new customers would be less enthusiastic and possibly spend less. It's possible that the added customers from their sportsbook possibly spend more than the daily fantasy customers, but DraftKings doesn't provide this information so I can't necessarily confirm if this is accurate. DraftKings balance sheet shows $2.5 billion in assets to $571 million in liabilities. This gives us $2 billion in equity. They actually reported no debt at all, so the balance sheet is very healthy. They actually have just over a billion dollars in cash on hand, so I really like what I see on this balance sheet. Looking forward to the forecasted revenue and earnings, they're expected to continue to lose money through 2022, but revenues are projected to break a billion dollars that year. Revenue growth has been growing at a pretty crazy rate, mostly over 40%, and that's projected to continue through 2022. So let's take a look at what DraftKings stock is worth. But before I do that, if you could take just one second to scroll down and hit the thumbs up button, I would really appreciate it. These videos do take a good amount of research to make and if you find them helpful I would really appreciate a quick thumbs up. So for DraftKings we're gonna have to use a price to sales ratio since they aren't profitable yet. So I think a growth rate of 30 to 35 percent is a good number for them. I know that they've been way over this number and they're forecasted to stay over it but I also think being a little conservative with your expectations is smart since we have limited historical information. But if you think this number should be higher feel free to watch my formula video to try to create your own calculations. I looked at a bunch of casino stocks and they all pretty much show 10 to 20% profit margins in 2019. So I think this is probably appropriate for DraftKings too. So this 30 to 35% growth rate comes out to a PE of 126 to 185. At a 10 to 20% profit margin, this would be a price to sales ratio somewhere between 12.6 to 37. So with a trailing revenue of 423 million, this gives us a valuation between five to $15 billion or 13 to $40 per share. The full 2020 revenue forecast projects 550 52 million, which brings the valuation up to 7 billion to 20 billion, or 18 to 52 dollars per share. Analysts are forecasting 2021 to bring in 848 billion dollars in revenue, giving us a valuation between 10 to 31 billion, or 27 to 80 per share. Looking at this on a chart, we can see that the current share price is forecasted to hit fair value sometime between 2021 and 2023. At the growth rate they've been achieving, I would say that the stock is currently fairly valued, and I think right now though that there is a ton of upside. Now this graph is much shorter than the five-year charts that I usually make. That's because I don't have as much information to really go off of here. The biggest game changer to the business, the sports book, is really just starting. I don't want to get too ahead of myself and make a wild projection that I'm not really that certain of. I feel pretty good about guessing what the business will generate over the next three years, but beyond that, so many things could happen to change things. I really don't want to put out a valuation that I'm not totally confident in. Now I don't own any DraftKings stock, but it's definitely a business that I'm interested in. I didn't realize how much potential there was for the sports book until I learned that the North American market only has about 5% of their sports betting online. So there is a huge opportunity for DraftKings. The growth this company is achieving is really impressive and I do like that they carry absolutely no debt. I do own Penstock, which is a competitor to DraftKings with the Barstool Sportsbook, but none of this would really change how I look at DraftKings. So that's the video. If you found this kind of content helpful, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell notification so you know whenever I upload a new video. And as always, Thanks for watching.